All right, so I think I'll start. Yeah. All right. Uh, welcome to um, the next lecture in our series uh, in the Jaffer Center. Um, so today, uh, Amanda Smith is going to be giving us a lecture on love and marriage among American Muslims. Um, so she herself is an American Muslim and a speaker on Islam. She has a degree in international studies and is passionate about cross-cultural communication and understanding. She works with the Coalition of South, Muslim, uh, South Florida Muslim Organizations, Cosmos, as a speaker for their Islam uh, Today program and is presented at Miami Dade College. She also works with Neighbors in Faith, a Seattle-based interfaith organization speaking on Islam in churches in Washington State. So we're very honored to have her to talk to us today about love and marriage among American Muslims. It's always tricky trying to mic yourself with a hijab. Oops, let's do it this direction. Okay, can you hear me okay? That's good, okay, excellent, excellent. All right, um, so thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to get to be here today at FIU. Um, and I'm really excited to get to talk about this specific topic. So this is one where unfortunately a lot of the misperceptions about Muslims in general is rooted in. Um, a lot of people in mainstream American society will have a lot of very um, off misconceptions about what Muslims think about marriage, what Muslim marriages are like, um, and what Muslims think about love. So I'm really excited to be here today and to, to get into such an important topic. So the first thing that I need to discuss um, before I get directly just into talking about marriage and just talking about love is I need to talk about what Islam teaches about how men and women should interact with each other in general, right? Um, and so who here, can you hear me? Is the mic, it's, it's all, oh, okay. The mic is only for recording. I'll try to talk louder. Okay. Um, so aside from the Muslims in the room, the non-Muslims in the room. When I say the word hijab, who here knows what that means? I'm assuming, I'm hoping most of the students here are going to know what a hijab means. Okay. So when I say the word hijab, someone, what does it mean? Shout it out at me. You have an answer? So, okay, that's a good answer, a good answer. So um, in common speech, right, when the word hijab, it's normally used to apply to this piece of fabric, right, that Muslim women will use to cover their hair when they're in public, right? However, when we're talking about Islamic theology, uh, the hijab doesn't refer to just this piece of fabric. It actually refers to a much larger body of beliefs and practices about how men and women who are not family members should interact with each other. Um, so there's multiple dimensions to this practice. One, of course, um, is the dimension of clothing, right? So Muslims generally across the board are, agree, right, that Muslim men and women should dress modestly, meaning that they should dress in a way that is not intentionally designed to attract the attention of the opposite gender or to be um, provocative in any way. We're supposed to dress, you know, with the mindset to be modest and not to attract that sort of attention of the opposite gender. Different Muslims have different opinions to the extent at which they should cover. So a lot of Muslim women um, are of the view that the religion teaches that we should cover everything except for our face and our hands. And so that's why you'll see many Muslim women covering their hair, wearing long sleeves, long pants. Um, in Islamic theology, women don't just wear hijab, right? So this applies to men too. Different Muslims, right, are going to have different opinions about the exact extent of coverage. However, there is a consensus that men are supposed to dress in a way that um, is considered modest. And, um, you know, they should be presenting themselves in a way that is respectful of themselves and other people around them. The second dimension of hijab, which a lot of people say is actually the more important dimension, is actually about your behavior. So if someone is covered up, but they behave in a way that's not modest, then it doesn't really matter how they're dressing. Right? So one thing Muslims believe is that you should behave in a way that's modest, you should behave in a way that is respectful of people of the opposite gender, and not with the intention right, to attract um, attention of people of the opposite gender and not to, on purpose, be um, provocative. 
So with that, Muslims have a few very specific practices when it comes to um, hijabi behavior. Um, and one Islamic practice is um, often what's termed averting one's gaze, which basically means if you see somebody who looks attractive, you shouldn't look at them, you shouldn't ogle at people of the opposite gender, it's more respectful to look away, right? So being totally blunt for the millennials in the room, we consider it a sin to check people out, right? So you're not supposed to be doing that, that's considered a disrespect to people of the opposite gender. Um, this unfortunately can lead to a lot of the miscommunications and misunderstandings that will arise when Muslims and non-Muslims interact with each other. So a lot of times, for example, if someone has a male Muslim coworker, they might notice that that Muslim guy won't look at them directly in the eye or may look to the side or look down at the ground when they interact with each other. And a lot of people in this region of the world will interpret that behavior as um, being disrespectful, as trying to belittle that person. Um, but for Muslim men who do that, right, their intention is actually the exact opposite. Right? The intention is to be respectful. The same thing with Muslim women. So in this region of the world, when a Muslim woman might look away when she's talking to a man or might look down, people will misperceive that as um, her thinking of herself as inferior or for some reason um, feeling intimidated to talk to a man, and that's not the case at all. It's the way Muslims believe we show respect to someone of the opposite gender. Another specific practice that Muslims will do is um, they will not touch someone of the opposite gender outside of marriage who they're not related to. So again, these standards, you know, don't apply to someone's dad or their brother or, you know, their close blood-related family members. It refers to people who they are not related to. So Muslims um, obviously will not have intimate relationships outside of marriage, uh, but hugging, kissing, even things like that, most Muslims will not um, do that before marriage. And a lot of Muslims actually will take this so serious to the point that they actually will not shake hands with some of the opposite gender who they're not married to. Um, and this again leads to a lot of um, miscommunications, misunderstandings. Um, so unfortunately in one of the Nordic countries, there, a Muslim woman actually had to litigate <laughs> for her right not to shake um, hands of someone that she didn't want to shake hands with. Um, but here a lot of people will misinterpret. So if someone refused to shake a hand, people might assume you know, that that person is being disrespectful, doesn't like them, thinks they're dirty, but that's not the case at all. If a Muslim declines to shake your hand and instead greets you with like a small little bow, something like this is what a lot of Muslims will do, their intention there is to show respect as someone of the opposite gender because one of the things we believe is that you should not be touching outside of marriage. Okay, so with that established, let's go ahead and start talking about marriage. So marriage is a very important um, belief in Islam. If Muslims can get married, they should get married. It's an extremely important thing. You don't have to, right? So if someone doesn't have the opportunity, doesn't find the right person, it's not a sin, it's not something that's a big deal, but if someone has the opportunity, they should not waste that opportunity. They should make an effort to get married. Um, we have a hadith or a saying from our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, that says, whoever likes to follow my sunnah, meaning lifestyle or path, his way, um, should marry for marriage is from my sunnah, from my lifestyle. So Muslims have two sources of Islamic guidance where we get our beliefs and our practices from. One is the Holy Quran, our holy book, and the other is from the Prophet Sunnah, meaning his lifestyle, things that he did in his life. Um, we believe that by following the things that he did, that is a way to achieve nearness towards God. Um, marriage is often referred to as half of one's faith. So again, it's a very important aspect of religious practice if you're able to do it. Um, so big that it's referred to as, as half of your faith. So how do Muslims find a spouse? So this is something that unfortunately is subject to a lot of the misunderstandings. Um, in American society, there's a lot of um, images and perceptions that Muslim women are often forced by their dad or their brother to marry some ogre that they don't like. You know, a really awful sort of nightmare kind of images, right? But the reality is not the case. Um, so before I jump into how Muslims find a spouse, because there are differences, I want to first establish what's kind of the more general practice here in America. And of course, everyone's different. Everyone, you know, found their spouse a different way, found their partner a different way. You know, different cultures, different faiths are going to have different perspectives. But just a very general sort of overview of what's common in this country. Um, normally it'll start, right, with an initial interest, boy meets girl, girl meets boy, they have similar personalities, similar interests, they find each other physically attractive. For some reason they just are interested initially. Um, the next step would be dating, 
right? So normally it's, it's common for couples to go out to the movies, go have fun, engage in some kind of activity for the purpose of getting to know one each other better, right? Um, and the general purpose, right, of dating, most people perceive, is to, you know, go out, have fun, enjoy being in the company with another person, and also, right, to determine if you want to continue to be with that person. Do you really like with that person? Could you be in love with that person? And this process, right, for some people can be short, some people can be very long. Many people will date for, for many, many years. Commitment levels, right, will also gradually sort of increase, normally over a period of many years, right? So after a couple dates, people, you know, they might decide that they want to be boyfriend, girlfriend, want to be like an official sort of item. Um, it's very common in our generation now to live together, sometimes for several years before becoming engaged or before getting married. And then gradually, right, those levels of commitment will move up to an engagement, to marriage. And again, it's very common for this process to take um, many years. Right? So the conventional wisdom now in the United States is that you should take a very long time to get to know someone before getting married. Um, and so normally people will take you know, their time doing so. Um, conversations regarding practical aspects of marriage normally happen in later stages of this. Right? So the conventional wisdom here is if you're on a first date with somebody and they ask you how many kids you want to have, right, you're going to go running. That's pretty shocking. So for the mainstream American society, that's a big red flag, not something you talk about early on. Um, Muslims, however, have a different model. So it starts off largely the same way. There's an initial interest, and it could be for a lot of the same reasons. So a Muslim woman, Muslim man meet each other at school or work or in their, their local mosque, um, you know, feel that they have similar personalities, similar interests, you know, that sort of thing, similar, similar reasons. Um, initial interest, though, might often first be sparked for a few different reasons. Um, the first one is potential compatibility. And this is based on a very practical sort of sense for marriage, right? So oftentimes in mainstream American society, if you meet someone, the first thing you, know, you don't think is, does this person have similar religious perspectives to me about how to raise children, right? That's, that's not gonna be your first thought. However, if two Muslims notice that they're going to the mosque regularly at the same, the same kind of time, same kind of functions, they have a similar level of religiosity, has similar views on important issues like marriage and family and finances. Noticing, noticing that they're compatible in these practical aspects is something that a lot of people will feel is a good reason to be initially interested in the person. Another source of initial interest is actually based on opinions of friends, family, and community members. So something that's very common in Muslim communities is to have your parents, your religious leaders, your close friends actually look for a partner for you. Um, and I actually, I have a very funny story about this. Um, several years before I actually met my husband, my mother, um, who is not a Muslim, went to a grocery store to pick up halal meat for me because I was coming home to visit. And when she's in this grocery store, the clerk, you know, was really surprised to see her, has a conversation. It was really excited to see a non-Muslim person that was so accepting of her Muslim daughter, right? And my mother told me that um, he then proceeds to shout something in a language she doesn't understand in the back room. And out pops this young gentleman and the storekeeper goes, this is my son. He's very good. <laughs> and proceeded <laughs> to try to convince my mother that, that, my, that his son and me would make a very good match. And my mother called me up and told me what happened. And she said, this man said this to me with a straight face. Well, people just come out with marriage proposals like that? And I said, yeah, actually that would be the modus operandi. That is not strange at all for a lot of Muslims around the world. Um, so it's very common, right, to have your parents look for a spouse for you, to have an imam, somebody who knows you well, who thinks, hey, this person has a lot in common with this person, let's try to get them together. Okay, um, the next stage is communications begin. And this is similar, right, to dating in that the primary purpose of it is to determine if the two people are going to be compatible. But it's different in several ways. The first one is that um, in Islam, the general teaching is that the primary purpose should not be just to go have fun, right? That it's fun to go hang out, watch a movie with a guy or a girl, so let's just go, right? We believe that your communications with people of the opposite gender um, should have a purpose, should be respectful, and generally it is not good to go out and just have fun of, with, of, with people of the opposite gender, right? There's supposed to be a purpose behind your communications. 
Um, the second difference, right, is that normally Muslim men and women will not be alone with each other. So they'll talk over the phone, email. If they talk in person, it's in a public place or in someone's home with parents or other people present. Um, there's a very popular hadith in Islam that says a man and woman are not alone with each other except that Satan is the third among them. So it's discouraged to be alone with people of the opposite gender. The third big difference is actually the topic of the conversation, right? So like I mentioned before, for most Americans, if someone asks you how many kids you want to have on your first date, that's a big red flag, right? Whereas in Muslim communities, that's a perfectly practical question to ask. Because our purpose in these communications is to determine, hey, is this someone that I'm going to be compatible with in the long term? So a lot of Muslims will think, okay, what do I want in a spouse before they even start talking to someone or start considering someone to be their spouse? They'll think about, what are my views about family? What are my views about finances? What are my views about religion? You know, how religious do I want my spouse to be? What am I looking for in terms of compatibility? So discussions will normally be very serious to start with. It's okay to laugh and joke and have fun. It's not this boring, solemn occasion, right? But it definitely always has a purpose behind it. And then the next step is actually marriage, right? So it's important to note this middle stage where people talk and try to decide if they're compatible or not, it can be very short. And I know lots of people who spent a very short time talking to their partners and have been married for decades and are very happy. That same portion, right, can actually be very long. And I know people who took a year or two to decide if someone was the right person for them. And they've been married for decades and are very happy. Um, but in you know, Islamic theology, once two people agree that they're a match, I like you, you like me, the next step is to go ahead and get married. What practically happens in a lot of Muslim communities is couples will go and get their religious marriage first. So in Islam, just like Christianity and many other faiths, we have a, sort of the equivalent of like saying your vows, right? We have specific words that are recited, a way to get married. Um, Muslims will sign a marriage contract that I'll talk about later here. Um, and that's the way that we are considered married before God. Right, but then the process of going to a courthouse, getting your marriage license and all of that, that's understood as the secular process to be recognized as married before the law. So some Muslims might do both things at the same time, but for practical purposes, what often happens um, in a lot of communities and a lot of families is they'll get their religious marriage first, and then there'll be a waiting period in between. So maybe a few months or a year in which they'll plan their actual wedding party, um, continue to get to know each other, and then later move in with each other and have their legal marriage and, and all that done. Um, an important thing to note is that in Islam, the perception is that love is something that should develop within a marriage. So even though it's okay, like it's natural to like feel love towards somebody, that's something that's going to come, it's not really a feeling that people can stop, it's a natural thing. But our view is that those feelings should be controlled and should not control us. So we should make our decisions about who we should be with in a more logical fashion, in a way that makes sense in terms of long-term commitment. Our primary focus in choosing a partner should not just be do we have a love attachment with another person. Our view is, is that after getting married and after feeling like, okay, this person's the right person for me, that real love is going to be developed and established within that union. So that's another very big difference in perception there. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about are marriage contracts, right? So how Muslims get married. So you can think of this almost sort of like a prenup, right? So this is something that will be done in American society sometimes. However, this is very, very, very common to have a written contract. Some Muslims will choose just to have you know, their imam or their local leader read the, read the marriage vows for them and marry them without this contract. But by and large, a written contract is very, very common. Um, this contract in Arabic is known as an aqad. And it covers basically the rights and responsibilities of both parties in the marriage, right? What their expectations are according to Islamic belief. And it also covers a couple other things. The first one is a dowry. So a lot of people in this region of the world will have perceptions of dowries that are informed based on older traditions from non-Muslim societies. So a lot of people will think that a dowry is something that the, groom, the bride's family will give the groom right as payment, like here, you're taking my daughter away from me. That's not what it is. Um, a lot of people will also perceive a dowry as something that the groom will pay to the bride's father as almost like payment for his wife. Again, that is not what a dowry is whatsoever. Um, a dowry within Islam is actually seen as more like a gift, something that the groom will give the bride when they get married. 
And it can literally be anything that the couple agrees to. So I know some couples who've agreed to something so small as just like a copy of the Quran. And I know other couples who asked for $50,000. So it can be literally anything that the parties agree upon. It's something that the groom should give the bride. Um, and then also conditions, right? So Muslims, we do have the right to put conditions in our marriage. So for example, if X, Y, and Z were to occur, I have the right to get a divorce. So one very common condition that will occur in this region of the world, because we have our, our religious marriage, but we also have to go get married in terms of the court for our, our marriage to be recognized by the law, is a lot of people will put in their marriage contracts that if someone files for divorce in the civil court, then you have to give me an Islamic divorce, right? You can't divorce me legally and then say religiously you're still my wife, right? Not cool. So a lot of people will write that in their marriage contracts. Another thing that's interesting is that there are actually um, different types of marriage contracts. So the first one is what most people will think of generally as a marriage, right? A permanent lifelong union between two people. The second type, it's something that is normally only practiced by people of the Shia tradition. It's what's called a temporary marriage, and it's a very interesting sort of tool here. Um, so within the Shia tradition, they have what's called a temporary marriage. And within the Shia tradition, it's considered to be an equally valid type of Islamic union. The only difference between a permanent marriage and a temporary one is that the temporary one is time bound. Meaning that two parties agree, okay, I'm going to be together, we're going to be in this relationship for one year, two years, however long they agree, right? And then at the end of that time, three different things can happen. One, the time expires, you can say, hey, it was so nice to be with you, thanks so much, peace out, and it sort of goes back, right, to the very formal relationship between two people who are not related to each other anymore. The second thing that can happen in um, Shia Jew jurisprudence is that it can be renewed, so you can decide, okay, hey, this worked, let's do it for another year, that's perfectly fine. Um, or instead, if the couple decides, hey, we really like each other, let's make this permanent, I want to be with you for the rest of my life, and then go ahead and go get a regular permanent marriage. Um, in Shia communities within North America, this type of union um, is often used for engagement periods. So once they decide they want to be together, but they don't want to go ahead and get their permanent marriage yet, it's not uncommon for Shias to, to do a temporary marriage for a few months to a year or so while they plan their wedding. That's something very common. Um, another thing that it's used am amongst Shia communities is like a substitute for dating. So for example, if someone is in a position where um, they, I'm sorry, a substitute for dating. So for example, like a lot of converts in the United States who, who are converts to Shia Islam, who are more comfortable with the American model of dating, but understand that that model isn't the way that we're supposed to do it Islamically, they'll go ahead and get a temporary marriage with someone. So that way they can take their time, they can gradually move up in levels of commitment in the way that they're used to and that they're more comfortable with. Um, and then later move on to a permanent marriage if they feel comfortable. So a lot of American Shia converts will use this as a substitute for dating. Um, and then finally, when a regular marriage is not possible. So for example, if someone's in a situation where they can't handle the financial responsibilities of a permanent marriage, or if they're going to be abroad for many years, but they don't want to be by themselves the whole time, um, a lot of Shias will use this in that type of situation. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about in this vein is something that um, is also subject to a great deal of misunderstandings and a lot of the Islamophobia that Muslims experience, and it's because of plural marriages. It's something a lot of people freak out about. So there is a perception in the United States that Muslim men are just like swimming in wives, right? And we'll just have huge harems and ladies all over everywhere, and that is not at all the case. Um, so polygamy is an exception, not a rule within Islam. Um, and within, when Islam, right, was first developing as a religion, it was in a society where men were able to have literally as many wives as they want, and they would have these very huge harems. And so what Islam did, it didn't create polygamy, it actually limited it within that society, right? So instead of allowing men to just have as many women as they wanted, it limited men to only having four wives, right? And even then on top of that, what Islam did was begin to encourage the practice of monogamy, right? Um, so within Islam, the teaching was that if a man has multiple wives, more than one, they have to treat them both exactly equally. And when we say exactly, it means exactly, right? So two women don't have to be forced to share a house with each other. If one woman has a $200,000 house, the other wife has the right to ask for her own $200,000 house, and it better be exactly equal in value. If you do so much as bring a spoon 
to one lady's house, you have to bring a spoon to the other lady's house. You have to treat both of these ladies exactly equally. So it's, it became right, seen as a very serious responsibility to have more than one wife. And there's a hadith within Islam that says a man who has two wives who he did not treat equally will arise on the day of judgment split in half. So <laughs> it's, it's a really big deal. It's, this is seen as a responsibility, not an opportunity for somebody to get to, to mess around. Um, monogamy, again, is encouraged. So in the verse of the Quran that talks about this, it says, um, right? So if you think you are not going to be equal between them, only marry one. So monogamy is the norm, and monogamy is what is encouraged. Um, and it's important to remember Islam came at a time when that was not seen, right, as the height of society. So one of the things, one of the changes they institute was to try to encourage monogamy. Okay. So now that we've talked about different kind of marriages, how Muslims get married, let's talk about weddings, right? Woo, we're to the fun part. Um, so in Islam, right, it's not required to have a big wedding party, right? There's no reason you have to do it. However, it is considered to be following the Prophet's way, his sunnah, to at least have some sort of wedding party. Uh, a lot of people refer to this as a walima, right? Um, and the, the guidance from the prophet is, you know, have like some sort of like reception or something with your friends, family, community members, share your union with people in your community, with your friends and family, um, and then feed them at that, right? It's considered good to give your guests food. Um, and it's also considered good for it to not be unnecessarily overly extravagant. So there's a very beautiful story actually about the prophet's daughter Fatima, peace be upon her. Um, where she came to her wedding actually wearing a very old dress. And this was at a time when Muslims were experiencing a great deal of um, economic instability and insecurity. So she really only had one dress to wear, and she was wearing the one dress she owned. And when it was time for her to get married, the Holy Prophet bought her a brand new, beautiful dress. And then on her wedding day, she shows up wearing her old dress, and the Prophet asks her, where is the nice new dress that I bought you? And what she tells her father is that a needy person came to her who was in need of clothing. And her first impulse was to give this needy person her old dress. But she remembered a verse from chapter 3 of the Quran that says, um, which means you will not achieve righteousness until you give from what you love. And so remembering that verse and recognizing that she loved her new dress more, she gave her new dress to the person who was in need and she got married in her, her old dress. Um, so that said, right, it's considered, you know, better to not be overly extravagant, right? And also, of course, the general meaning of that story is to give from what you love. Don't give people, don't give cream corn for the food drive, right? <laughs> give, give the good stuff when the food drive comes around, right? Okay, so with those guidelines, right, Muslim weddings can be formatted to basically whatever the couple wants, how they want their wedding to look, cultural practices, basically however they want to do it, what their family's expectations are, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, so over here on the far side, this is a picture of an African-American couple and what looks like a very traditional American kind of wedding. White brides in a beautiful white dress, they're exchanging you know, what looks like marital vows in the way most Americans will do it. Over here, right, we have an Asian couple that, you know, again, wearing the beautiful white kind of dress, but then they've also done some of their own things. So the groom is wearing his cultural clothing. The bride chose to get henna. Um, here's an example of a wedding from an Indo-Paki community. So a lot of, you know, South Asians won't wear white to their wedding, so wear bright, you know, these beautiful, colorful dresses. You see the bride is wearing red. Over here in this image, you have a picture of this gorgeous henna tattoo. Um, one thing that uh, you'll notice, so if you research henna, right, for some reason I often will see henna referred to as an Islamic tradition um, in a lot of henna forums. Um, however, it's, there's nothing, it doesn't have anything to do with Islam, right? It's something that a lot of people who live in places where they're also Muslim will do. So a lot of Hindu women, for example, will also do henna at their weddings. And that's a cultural practice that if the bride likes it, she can do it. So there's, there's flexibility in how you want your wedding to be. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about, now that we've talked about the wedding, let's talk about the marriage, right? So what are Muslim marriages like? Well, Muslims are human beings like everybody else. Our marriages are going to be a lot like everybody else's. So there's going to be good times, bad times, times where we have to be patient, times where we need to learn to resolve conflicts in peaceable ways, just like any other couple goes through. 
Um, but the way Muslim households are structured, right, there's a few differences from what's the mainstream here. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is economics, right? So who's responsible for working? Who's responsible for bringing home the bacon? So in Islam, if men are able to, it's considered to be their responsibility to provide for their wives and children. So if they are able to work, they should go work. But the difference from a lot of other traditions that have a similar perception is that women do not have to stay home if they do not want to. So if women can work, if women want to work, they can work. It's not considered a sin, it's not considered a bad thing at all for Muslim women to work. Um, and actually the Prophet's first wife, Khadija, um, peace be upon her, she actually met the Prophet because he was her employee. Um, she was actually one of the richest, most wealthy women, people, one of the most wealthy people in Mecca in her time. Um, and he actually worked as a trader for her. That's how they met. Um, so women can work. The difference though is that her income is considered to be hers. So if a woman works, what she makes belongs to her. If she does not want to use it to pay the rent, she does not have to. You can, and practically speaking, especially in this part of the world where it's very expensive to live, a lot of Muslim women who do work will help pay the bills, but it's not considered to be their job. Another um, aspect that's a little bit different is the division of labor. So like I said, Muslim women are not required to stay home. There's no reason that says that they have to cook and that they have to clean. Practically speaking, in many Muslim homes, because men have the responsibility to go work, a lot of Muslim women will stay home, they will cook, they will clean if they want to. But this isn't considered something they have to do, it's considered something good that they are doing out of the goodness of their hearts. Right? There's no reason they have to do it. Um, men are strongly encouraged to be a part of homemaking. So the Holy Prophet himself actually sewed his own clothes. Um, he cooked and he cleaned. He did not expect his wives to do all of that for him. Um, so men should be involved in that aspect of the home as well. Okay. Family life, right? Um, so in Islam, if a couple can have children, it's considered very good to have children. Again, you don't have to have kids. It's not a sin if you don't have kids. But if you can have kids, it's very good to have kids. Um, children are seen as a means of getting closer to God. So by raising your children in an Islamic way, instilling good values in them, that's one of the ways that we gain closeness to God. Um, good children are also seen as a source of blessing after one's death. So in Islamic theology, um, we do believe that your actions do have an impact on if you go to heaven or hell. Um, and we believe that when you die, your actions are done, right? So you have until you die, except for things you've done in your life that continue to have a positive effect after you've already passed away. Um, so for example, if you start a school, right, and if that school continues to function and educate people, you're going to receive blessings for that even after you've passed away. If you plant a tree, right, every time that tree feeds someone, that is a source for blessings for you even after you've passed away. Um, and there's a hadith from our prophet that state that a good child who continues to pray for their parents, who does good deeds, good children are considered a source of blessing for their parents even after they have passed away. Um, parents have a great deal of rights in Islam, so when children grow up, they should care for their parents. Um, they should respect them and continue to listen to them throughout their life. So there isn't this concept of, I'm 18 years old, so I don't have to listen to my parents anymore. They need to respect whatever I want to do. Of course, your parents should respect you and, and all of that, um, but it's considered wise to listen to your parents' counsel throughout the rest of your life. Um, there's also a very beautiful saying in Islam that heaven is at the feet of mothers. So women, uh, mothers especially, are seen to be very high. And there's a verse in the Quran that says, and I, God speaking about himself, and I have enjoined on man to be dutiful and good to his parents. His mother bore him in weakness and hardship upon weakness and hardship, and his weaning is two years, referring to the process of, of breastfeeding there. Give thanks to me and to your parents, and unto me is the final destination. So here it's considered um, extremely important to be good to your parents. Being good to your parents is a mean of getting closeness towards God. And the Quran recognizes the hardship that women go through just to give birth to a child, and that children should respect their parents for the sheer fact that you exist because your parents went through all that for you. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about um, is love, 
right? So we've talked about all these practical things, you know, all the logical aspects of marriage. Um, but what about love? And so, yes, you know, Muslims are human beings like everybody else. So we believe that God created love between men and women as something that's a blessing. Um, and of course we love our spouses. So there's this very sad sort of perception in mainstream American society that Muslim men will often beat their wives, um, that Muslim women are often subject to domestic violence. And I know many Muslim men that are extremely infuriated <laughs> by this stereotype, right? Because they love their wives, they want to follow the teachings of our prophet, um, and get really infuriated, right, when people assume that they harm their wives, that they harm their children. Um, the reality is that's not the case at all whatsoever. Um, so what Islam teaches, is that the best of men are those who are best to their wives. That is the saying from our holy prophet, peace be upon him and his family, right? So you should treat both spouses, right? You should treat each other with love and compassion. And there's a beautiful verse in the Quran that talks about this, and it says, and among his signs, referring to God, and among his signs is that he created for you mates from among yourselves, that you may dwell in tranquility with them, right? So have peace and happiness in your home. That you may dwell in tranquility with them and that he put love and mercy between your hearts. Verily in that are signs for those who reflect. So the fact that men and women love each other, that they're kind to each other, that they show each other mercy. So when somebody messes up, you forgive your spouse. You're patient when your spouse on those mornings when they drive you crazy, you know? Those are all considered to be important aspects of marriage and considered to be blessings from God. All right, and so with that, uh, thank you again for inviting me here, and I am excited to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Yes. Um, a question I'm approached with a lot, and I would love to hear your perspective on it, um, is relation to the number of wives that the prophet took on. Um, I, I know that some extent that it, each wife had a reason and that he was being an example for all mankind. You could talk about that a little bit um, and also if you could specifically address his marriage to Aisha. Aisha yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Excellent, excellent. So this is something also that's a source of a lot of Islamophobia, a lot of misunderstandings about Muslims. Um, yes, so our Holy Prophet did take more than one wife. But it's important also to know that there's a lot more history to what goes on here. So the Holy Prophet was only married to one woman for most of his life, right? For several decades of his life. It wasn't until near the end of his life, right? That he had more than one wife. Um, and like the sister mentioned, his other wives were taken for specific purposes, right? So for reasons like to secure like political alliances, uh, things like that, right? Um, in that time, you have to remember that this was something that was extremely common, right? So here in the West, having more than one wife is seen as like this big sort of <gasps> source of, of moral outrage. This is our culture. This is seen as a bad thing. Something to understand that even today, there are a lot of places around the world that aren't Muslim where polygamy is seen as a good thing, right? And so you can find, for example, places around the world where women will fight each other to get to be in a polygamous union, right? So this is something that's our perception. For some reason, in, in the West, we're very uncomfortable with this practice, but it's not the case around the world. Um, and Islam is not a religion that's just meant for one culture or to fit into one specific cultural box. It's meant to be a religion for all mankind and all societies. So of course, there's going to be things that might not make sense in one culture, but make perfect sense in another. Um, another thing that she mentioned that's also a source of a great deal of controversy is the marriage to um, the prophet's wife, Aisha. Um, and so there's a lot of disagreement, right, about how old she was when she married. So there's a lot of sources that say she was 16 years old when she married the prophet. There are some sources that say that she was 9 years old when she married the prophet. And so a lot of people will use this, right, and I saw some eyes perk up, oh my god. Right? <laughs> um, and again, right, a lot of people will use this, right, to say, you know, your prophet is a pedophile, da 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 da, and we'll use this as a source of Islamophobia. So let's talk about it. Again, this was at a time where even that practice was actually very common. Um, and if you see, so the scholar um, Hamza Youssef, who is one of the, the professors and an Islamic scholar at Zaytuna College in California, he has a great speech where he talks about this. And what he says is that he has read at the time of the prophet and in the close you know, generations after, lots of people were very critical of the prophet. Lots of people had all kinds of you know, horrible, awful things to say, but never once in any criticism of the prophet did he ever see anyone object to his marriage to Aisha, even though she was young. 
because at that time and that age, that was something seen as very common. That wasn't something seen as amoral. That said, right, these same traditions say that that marriage wasn't consummated until after, right, she became fully mature and that she's the one who initiated it. Another thing that you can also see very clearly in the way that she talks about the Prophet is that Aisha very dearly loved her husband, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. She definitely very dearly loved him. She cared about him a lot, right? And so this is clearly not an example of someone, you know, someone who's being taken advantage of and held against their will by this horrible pedophile, right? She loved him, she cared about him, and that was her normal. You know, lots of people did that in her time and her society. Thank you. Okay. Another question. Yes. If they want to, right? So, so in Islamic law, if they want to, they can. But if they don't want to, they don't have to. So if they say, I want my own house, you have to give your own house with just as much value. It's a very important responsibility. Do you have to spend the same amount of time? Yeah. Actually, yes, yes. So um, if you do, and again, right, it's a very important responsibility. So if you spend one day with one wife, you have to spend one day with the next one. So you have to be equal in the amount of time you spend with them, equal in the amount of money that you spend on them. It has to be very precisely equal. Um, yes? So when the prophet had the first one for a long time and had the other one at the end of his life, he still had to treat all of them the same? Thing all of them the same. So he did not marry another wife. So his first wife that he was married to for several decades, she had actually passed away oh, okay. before he actually remarried. But even then, when he did remarry, and he did remarry multiple wives after his first wife passed away, yeah, he treated them all exactly equally. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm just curious, so this was framed within a heterosexual kind of couple. What do the teachings say about same-sex partnerships? Excellent question. Excellent. I was expecting it. Um, so for most Muslims around the world, right, you will meet people who have a different perspective. But most Muslims around the world are of the view that same-sex relationships um, are not something we're supposed to be doing. So the Quran does have several verses that talk about homosexual relations as a sin. Right? The same thing though, if you ask most Muslims around the world, right, they're going to say that it's not okay to persecute somebody or to be mean or to harm somebody because they're doing something we believe is a sin. Right? So I, I once had a very good um, gay coworker of mine where we got into this discussion and I said to him, yeah, my religion teaches that you know, we don't believe that that's the sort of union we're supposed to be doing. My religion also teaches you're not supposed to be eating that ham sandwich, but you don't see me ripping it out from your hand. Right? <laughs> so there are some Muslims, and you will meet some Muslims who do have a different perspective on that issue, but that is the majority opinion. Thank you. Excellent. And then I think I saw, did you have your hand raised? No? OK. Perfect. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, you mentioned how um, in Islam, the idea of blessings that will continue if you have to do a good deed, and that good, like building the school, for example, or having a child that does charity. Um, does something similar apply if for like a bad thing that may have been done or like if you have a, okay cool. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> That's where it gets scary. So one thing that Muslims believe um, is that God is extremely merciful and compassionate. So if you look in the Quran, every single chapter except for one of them begins with the phrase in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Um, and so we believe, right, that God will reward you. So for every good deed you actually do, right, God will reward you like tenfold for that one good deed. But for every bad deed that you actually do, right, it's like negative one point, right? It's almost like a, like a point system. You can think of it that way. Um, and we also believe that out of God's mercy, even though he will bless you for those sort of things, even after you die, if you do something that continues to, to do good after you die, if you do something bad, no, it doesn't continue to, to mark against you. Okay. Yes. Um, what's the most common form of marriage for Muslim Americans? Like a normal permanent marriage, the way we think about it. That's by far the, the norm and the so most common. The other one isn't that common? It's not that common. So temporary marriages are not very common, uh, but it is something that occurs. And then plural marriages are extremely rare. So again, the stereotype that Muslim men are just dripping in ladies, that's <laughs> very far from the truth. Okay. Yeah. Follow-up question. Could a um, temporary marriage include a multiple marriage? Technically, yes, but even then, the rules still apply, right? Yeah. So you would have to treat them exactly equally. Yeah, very good. It's very hard, honestly, for the simple person to be able to treat somebody exactly the same, to love that wife um, exactly the same. It's really very hard. So I mean, this is more of the exception. It's an extreme exception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. 
very good question. Um, so infidelity is something extremely frowned upon. Um, we do consider that to be a very serious sin. Um, that it's something, yeah, don't do it, you shouldn't do it. We also say, though, that it's good when couples have conflicts, right, to try to work these things out. Yes? When, when we talk about the temporary marriage, let's say the temporary marriage and you obviously had your relationship with that person, would it be seen bad? Because Perfect. Perfect. So lots of people are going to have different perceptions that are often informed culturally. So religiously, right, for people who follow the Shia sect of Islam, no. It's not seen as a bad thing at all whatsoever. It's something that you do. There are other Muslims who are of the view, right, that this isn't an Islamic practice. There's debate between the two major sects regarding that. And unfortunately, culturally, right, there are some people who are going to frown upon it whatever, right? Haters going to hate. But a lot of people, especially here in the West, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of people here in the West where that sort of model is actually a lot more common, it's not frowned upon as much. So a lot of like modern Shias, like the millennial era, don't hold those, those kind of misperceptions. Yes? Yeah, so it's considered within Shia jurisprudence, right? It's considered to be the same, but it's the only difference is that there is a time, it's time bound. Yeah, and so if, for example, within one of these unions, a child was to be born, that child has the same rights of inheritance, that child is considered legitimate, right? That child is considered to be just as much of a good Muslim child who was born into a married couple as someone else. Um, when the union would end, for example, though, the couple, they're both supposed to co-parent um, according to Islamic guidelines. Yes? Can you raise someone with a different belief system? Different Muslims will have different opinions on that. Very good question. So there are a lot of Muslims who are the view um, that Muslim men can marry people who are called people of the book. So people of the book refers to people who follow Abrahamic religion, so Judaism, Christianity, things like that. There are some Muslims who say that even in that case, no, that you should marry um, other Muslims. So it's, it's subject to debate. In this context, polygamy is against the law, but it work here. Excellent. So Sheikh Hamza Yusuf also discussed that in one of his talks. Um, and his view, right, so if people come to this country, one Islamic belief is that you should follow the laws of your country so long as they don't require you to do something that's against Islam. So if a law was passed that says, you know, everyone has to eat a ham sandwich on Monday, right? <laughs> we, we would have to break that law, right? But for example, a law that says that you cannot have more than one wife, you should follow that law because there's, there's no Islamic reasons why you should be able to just have one wife. And again, that is what is encouraged by Islam anyway. Excellent, we're getting, yes, Dr. Misbahi. Um, I was just wondering whether you can comment on uh, deciphering culture, cultural practices that have such a thick Islamic language to it that it's very hard to say actually what the theory is theologically and all kinds of things rooted on that. Mm. So I think that's an important consideration, especially because Muslims now live in the United States and it's a different culture. Probably have a brand of Islam which has sort of American approach to it. So I was wondering whether uh, there is a way to see whether there are certain cultural practices which have nothing to do with Islam, good or bad. You know, that's my number one question. The second question is that I think I'm, I'm trying to maybe you asked this question because I was I, did, I came back. And that's the question of sex and, and role of sex in relationships. You know, it seems to me that. Uh, that's a particularly uh, uh, focused uh, subject in Islamic relationships. That is, you cannot have a casual sex relationship mm -hmm. unless mm -hmm. it is based on a contractual agreement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can maybe elaborate on, on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So those two Absolutely. Okay. So the first question, um, he was asking me about how to separate, like, what's culture and what's Islam. Um, and this is something, for example, that I know a lot of converts, American converts to Islam, will struggle with when they join Muslim communities. Because they'll interact with Muslims who um, are from, you know, lots, 
you know, over 50 different countries around the world. And when they come the way they practice, right, they might not recognize that their practices are actually very steeped in their own culture. And a lot of people, it can be very difficult to sort out what's their culture and what's religion. Um, so an example, right, here in the U.S., a lot of Christians, right, when they think of Christmas, they think of Santa Claus and a Christmas tree. And those are very closely associated with their, with their practice of celebrating the birth of, of, the birth of Christ, be, peace be upon him. However, right, if someone lived in another region of the world that didn't see a, a Christmas tree in Santa Claus somewhere, right, they're going to be confused, what does this have to do with Christmas? That's not anywhere in the Bible, right? So the same sort of things will happen in Islamic communities, and that's a normal human sort of thing. Um, so one thing that um, I feel that all Muslims should do, and a lot of Muslims do do, is to make a lot of effort to study their religion and to understand what the religion itself actually teaches and to try to sort it out from their culture. Uh, but my view is that it just takes a lot of education. And it also takes a lot of self-reflection to be able to recognize, OK, is what I'm doing, is this something that's just my culture? Is this my religion? And also to be able to recognize the fact that neither one's necessarily bad, right? Um, that it's OK to do things that, you know, this is your cultural way of doing things. There's nothing bad about your culture. It's a big part of who you are. Um, but to be able to recognize that and be humble to see, OK, this isn't actually my religion. Um, the second aspect, the second question you asked about was about um, Casual relationships? Just the role of sex, because, you know, I mean, I think not only the life is changing in the Muslim society, but of course, it is very different. Yeah. So the component of sex and sexuality, as opposed to marriage. Okay. Um, and then they are not necessarily sequential, uh, not necessarily intrinsically connected, although they are connected in other ways, too. So, so, in other words, as a Muslim, a couple here, any, anywhere, Some has a problem with sex, or you think Islam doesn't have a problem with sex? Yeah, so, so sort of framing that, that sort of way. Very good, very Sorry, good. I'm very blunt about it, but I just no, that's okay. We're all adults in the room, right? Where no one's afraid of the S word, I'm sure. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so there, the Islam, I would say most people will agree that Islam doesn't have a problem with sex, right? Right, so we recognize like you need it in order for humans to continue to exist. Of course. Um, Islam also doesn't hold the view that maybe some other view religions may hold that sex is strictly for procreative purposes. So Islam recognizes that it's okay to be intimate with your spouse just because it feels good, right? That it's okay to be intimate with your spouse as a way to get closer to one another. Um, that's considered perfectly acceptable. But Islam does not teach that those sort of relationships outside of marriage are acceptable. So in some way or another, you do have to have an officially sanctioned um, union, right, before you engage um, in sexual relations, is what most people will say. Uh, but no, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, my view, actually, is that Islam is actually a very sexually liberal religion, but that we just have boundaries placed upon it. So um, it's not, in our view, a good thing to go and to be involved with people that you might not even know, to go hook up at the club. Um, we recognize that there's a lot of, of problems that can arise from that. We recognize that children who are born from unions where they might not know who their other parent is because their parent themselves might not know. We recognize that that is something that's very harmful for children. Um, so we feel that for the rights of children and that also for the rights for yourself to respect yourself, that that type of, of sexual relationship is, is not something we should engage in. Thank you. <laughs> excellent, excellent, perfect. Any other questions? Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Are married couples allowed to have sex during Ramadan? Very good question. Very good. Excellent. So, um, Ramadan, for those who might not be familiar, is the month of fasting that Muslims go through. So, from sunup to sundown, Muslims will not drink water, will not eat food, and will not have relationships with their spouse. However, at night, right, Muslims can eat, drink, and, and be intimate with their spouse. So at night, yeah. Excellent. Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Iqbal. Yeah, so um, with the young Muslim couple that you know, um, and those of the people who have problems within their marriage, what are some of the common issues that American Muslims face that might lead to divorce or sort of that might lead to challenges within their marriage relationship? Excellent. Um, well, one thing that I will say is that um, a lot of Muslims are of the view that um, those conflicts should be kept private. 
um, and that it's not good to, you know, and although this is also conventional wisdom, that if you have a conflict with your spouse, you shouldn't go tell other people about it. Um, so I normally try to keep my nose in my own business. <laughs> um, but, you know, certain things that I've seen, if you're just asking about my personal reflections, um, I know that, for example, there'll be tension in couples because of something like in-laws, right? In-laws, mother-in-law doesn't like the wife, and so there'll be conflict that way. Um, there might, for example, be conflict because one is perhaps more religious than the other one and they have different expectations of each other um, but a lot of these i think are conflicts that happen you know even for non-muslim couples so here in the u.s lots of people will complain about their mother-in-law it's very sad but very true i'm very <coughs> blessed i have a wonderful mother-in-law that i am going to say for the recording and she is for real <laughs> and for true very wonderful and i'm very lucky um, but you know that's something a lot of people a lot of people struggle with in-laws a lot of people you know their spouse will change and you know, expectations will change of each other. Um, but one thing that Islam does teach is to try to work out these things. Um, divorce is allowed. You can get a divorce, but there's a hadith that says the one permissible thing that shakes the throne of God is a divorce. So it's frowned upon, and Muslims are encouraged, you know, as much as possible to try to work out their problems and not to see divorce as an easy way out. Excellent. Yes, Dr. Misbahi. Uh, I don't know what the for preparation for this lecture, you, you did some uh, sort of a survey of the attitude of the Muslim women towards this notion that they don't have any financial responsibility in the marriage. I've seen that uh, actually becoming pretty serious in Iran now. That, you know, they, they, they didn't know about it, actually, most of the time. <coughs> mm. Now they know about it, and therefore, in their conversation with their husband, can actually make a religious claim that I do not have to contribute to the expenses. Yeah. Second, my money is my money. I can put it in the bank. And third, and I'm seeing that in many cities in Tehran, especially, and I don't have to work at home. I don't have to cook for you. I don't have to clean the house. Uh, and if I do, you have to pay for that. Uh, really serious. I've met yeah. people who, yeah. who actually, sometimes they want to make a point out of that the theological understanding. And of course, their husbands are completely that they such a thing exists, uh, and that they go and get a check. Uh, and I just was wondering whether you have to look at in other cultures, uh, beyond Iran and other Pakistan and others, whether this element, which has been hidden in many, many ways, you know, that actually there is no legal theological obligation for the woman to contribute financially and physically. Uh, in other words, the, 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 the man's responsibility is to provide not only Shelter, food, and everything else also help for the house, yeah. which most Muslim men in Iran have never heard that before until mm. the Islamic Revolution. <laughs> the revolution, bringing on rights for women. Who would have guessed? Ha ha, yes. <laughs> um, so I haven't seen any specific sort of surveys or anything on that. Um, just sort of my reflections um, based on your comment there, Dr. Misbahi. Uh, my first impression is I applaud Muslim women taking their rights by the reins. Actually, I'm really proud of Muslim women learning about their religion, how much it empowers them, and then taking their rights, right? And not allowing a society um, who didn't want to allow them their full rights in religion um, to just take it back. So I applaud women who are willing to do that. That said, um, one thing I will say that was um, mentioned by the scholar um, Sayyid Abbas in Seattle, actually, when I got married, um, he talked about this, right? And he said that sometimes there can be conflicts of marriage where the wife isn't really willing to contribute at all whatsoever, right? She plays that card, well, I don't have to do anything for you, right? Um, and he said that sometimes this will lead to conflicts because it is too much of a burden on one person if you have that attitude. And what he said was, is that in Islam, right, you still have to have love and mercy for your spouse. So you guys are a team, you're supposed to work together, work with each other. So it's, and it's a good, it's one of the good, most blessed things a woman can do is to choose to cook and clean and take care of her children. Um, so I would encourage people who have the attitude where they don't have to contribute at all to see their marriage as a partnership. Thank you, Dr. Misbahi. Any other questions? Yeah, you know, don't don't be mean to your spouse, right? And that's, yeah, that's conventional conventional wisdom. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, excellent, great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it.